We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We bless your name because you are the most high God. We are asking that the entrance of your word will bring light to the hearers, we bring deliverance and liberation to as many that have been held in captivity, and we ask that it will be a part that will lead us unto the heavenly city in Jesus' name. We are asking, Lord, that the word that will transform lives and bring glory to your name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to start a study on the signs and the readiness for the return of Christ. This is very, very important and is a cardinal doctrine of the Bible, but very scarce on many pupils and from many pastors. We are in the era that people go into motivational preaching, motivational speaking, and they leave the core, the center of the message. What the church and in fact the world will be expecting and looking up to is the return of Jesus Christ for his wife, the bride, the church of Christ. And then to conclude God's program for Israel and for the entire world. This is why it is important at this time for us to look at what are then the signs that will show us that we are at the door, that we are at that point that Christ will come. And then what should be my readiness, your readiness, the church's readiness, the readiness of the entire world for the return of Christ? You know, if a man, if a husband has traveled for some time and the day he is to come, the wife has must keep things ready, make the home clean, make the children clean, prepare for the return of the husband that have gone for a long journey for some days. Jesus, the groom, the head of the church, has left for over 2,000 years now. And the church is expecting his return. What then should be? First, the signs of that return. Two, the readiness of the bride of Christ to welcome him. And so we are, that's why it's important we'll be taking these studies in a series and we'll be trusting God that he will open the scriptures to us so that we can study together. So this uh, uh, evening we are looking at Behold, He Comet. Behold, his comet. That is the first topic we are considering. And we are reading from Revelations chapter 1. And we are, we'll read from verses 1, uh, verses 4 through to 8. Revelation chapter 1. I read from verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and had made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion, forever and ever, and everybody say, Amen. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. Jesus, who is the King of kings, Jesus, who has washed us from our sins in his own blood, the Bible says he is coming and we should look. That word behold means look, see, he is cometh with the clouds, and every eye 
every eye in every continent, every eye in every tribe, every eye from in every location shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And that verse concluded by saying, Even so, Amen. Let it be as it has been spoken. Say, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. So, he says, as, intro as John introduces the Savior, the head of the church, who died for our sins and washed us in his blood, and made us presentable unto God, and given us dominion and for, for his glory. He says, that is not the end of the work he is doing. That say, look, that same Savior, that same King of Kings, that same Son of God, that same Savior is coming. And he says, behold, watch out, look, see, he is coming with the clouds. I pray we will see him. I pray we will be ready when he appears. Chapter 3 of Revelation in verse 11. Revelation chapter 3. I read verse 11. He says, Behold, I come quickly. This is Jesus now saying, Look, I am coming quickly. That shows everybody must be up and doing. That means everybody must be ready. That means nobody should be lacking behind. That means nobody should postpone anything that he's supposed to do. Nobody will say, this thing I'm supposed to do today, let me leave it until next year. I know I need to repent today, but let me leave it until, until five years. I know I need to make restitution. I know I'm wrongly married. I know I've stolen people's property, and I need to give, them, give it back to them. But let me use this small and enjoy it. He said, no. We, anything we ought to do to correct our life, it has to be done quickly. There should be no postponement again. There should be no procrastination. Everything we need to correct in our life, it has to be done now because he is coming quickly. No more delay. Then he said, hold that fast which thou hast. What is good? What is pleasant? What is in line with the will of God? What is in line with the word of God? What we have done, the positive steps we have taken and the milestones we have covered, in getting ready, we should not lose that. We should not allow those positive ones to sleep. We should hold it fast, firmly, steadily, that no man take our crown. That shows there is a crown for every overcomer. But that crown can be lost. If we lose the, what we have gained, the space we have covered, the distance, positive distance we have taken on the narrow road that leads to heaven. If we have covered some kilometers on the narrow road and we are heading towards heaven, we should not turn back. We should not leave the road. We should continue because there is what we are, something we are pursuing. There is a focus. There is a destination. And that focus is the crown that is awaiting for us. Let nobody lose sight of the crown that is before him. That is why we have to hold tight, hold firmly what things we have, the ground we have covered and move ahead in order to get that crown. Revelation chapter 16. I'm reading verse 15. Behold, you see the word repeated again. In chapter 1, we saw it, behold, I come quickly. In chapter 3, behold, I come quickly. In chapter 16 again, he said, behold, I come as a thief. What does he mean? Does he mean he's coming to steal our properties? No. When he says, I come as a thief, he's merely saying, I am coming without any special 
definite announcement. I am coming on arrears. I am coming maybe in your at the time you least expected me. I am coming at the time you may not be ready. That is why I am telling you now to be ready. So that when I appear, my coming will not take you on our ways. He said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed. Happy. That word blessed means happy. It means fortunate. Blessed is he that is watching. He not he didn't say blessed is he that watched five years ago. Blessed is he that watched ten years ago. He said happy, fortunate is the one he watched for twenty years ago. Presently is still watching, and if Christ tarries in the next twenty thirty years, he will continue to watch. So is a present continuous experience. Watchfulness over our lives is not just in the past, it includes in the present and in the future until we see Christ face to face. Behold, I come as a thief. Fortunate and happy is he that is watching and keeps his garments, his character, his conduct, his spiritual attire, and keeps it clean, lest he walk naked. Sin makes every man naked before God. Rebellion makes every man naked before God. So if you don't want to be naked publicly before God, before the angels of heaven, and before the church of the firstborn, then we must keep our garments. We must keep our spiritual life, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. I pray nobody will see your shame. I pray the blood of Jesus will cover your shame so that on that day you will be clothed with the garment of righteousness. You will be clothed with the, with the linen that is white as wool, that is, as, and, and that is cleaner than anything, and that your garments will be attracting angels and will qualify to enter the pearly gates into heaven. Say, I come quickly. Um, therefore, there's need for us to watch. Revelation chapter 22, in verse 7. Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. He repeated it again. This is the fourth time. Behold, look, don't be distracted. Be focused. Mind where you are going. Don't allow the pleasures and the attractions of the world to distract you. Be focused. Look, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keep, keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. The emphasis is that what will make you fortunate and happy is that you are a doer. You are keeping the sayings, the teachings, and the prophecy, and the instructions of, that is written in the word of God. This is what the Lord is demanding. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. I am coming quickly, but I'm not coming empty. I have reward only for overcomers. I have reward for those who are fortunate, who are blessed. I have reward for those who are keeping the sayings and the prophecy of this book. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. To give every man according as his work shall be. The question is, how will your work be? You are working your character with God, how is he going to be? Your actions with God and with your fellow neighbors, how will he be? Say, blessed, happy and fortunate are those that will receive the reward that I'm going to give to every man how? According to the work. 
according to the work that we have done. Verse 20. He which testified these things said, Surely I come quickly. And amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. Say, surely, without doubt. Surely, without fail. Surely, without anything successfully opposing it. Surely, without anything changing the timetable of God. It is sure. It is certain. It is going to happen. He said, I come quickly. I'm no more delaying it. And the church and everybody said, Amen. Then he said, Even so, the way you have spoken it, let it be what? Let it happen. Let it come to pass. I pray his coming will not take any one of us on our ways in Jesus' name. And so we'll be looking into three areas. We'll be asking three questions. As we consider this topic, behold, he comments. We'll be asking three questions and we'll be attempting to answer them. The answer to these three questions will show whether we are ready or not, whether the church is ready or not, whether the world is ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say, yes, we are waiting for his return. We believe. Even people in the opposite religion, they say, yes, their book tells them that the, Jesus is coming again. But how ready are they? The Orthodox churches, they say, yes, is in their creed, the Apostles' Creed, they recite it every Sunday. But how ready are the people reciting this creed? The evangelicals, they recite this creed every Sunday in their service, but the question is, how ready are those people reciting this Apostles' Creed? How ready are they for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? So these three questions we are going to ask, and we will attempt to answer them. We show how ready we are. Number one question, why is Christ coming back again? He came before he was rejected. The Jews rejected him. The Roman government rejected him. His people rejected him. The Bible says he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, received him, to them he gave power to become what? Sons and daughters of God. Why people rejected him at his first coming? I, why then is he coming again? That is the question will be one question we'll be looking at then the second question is where is he coming to where is he going to come and then the third question is when is christ coming why where and when when is the time so we look at number one why is christ coming back why is he coming back Number one, to fulfill prophecy. There's a lot of prophecy in, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about Christ that has not been fulfilled, including the ones himself gave. And those scriptures must be fulfilled because the Bible says the scriptures cannot be broken. It cannot fall to the ground. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one judge or title of the word of God we, we fall to the ground without it being what? Fulfilled. So all those prophecies about him that has not been fulfilled, he's coming back to fulfill them to the letter because the scripture cannot be broken. John chapter 14. And I'm reading verses 1 through to verse 3. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. See it there. He himself said it. He said, I will come again after I finish preparing a place for you, for the church, for the believer, for the children of God. Say, when I finish that preparation, I will come again. 
Note it, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. No matter the multitude of people that meet the criteria, there is a space for you in heaven. I have a good news for you. If you can be ready, if you can be prepared, if you will meet the condition, there is a space for you in heaven. There, nobody will get crash. There is a space for you there, there will be no lack. You may not get a space here in the world. You may not have mansions in the hybrid areas of the world, or you may even be a tenant, but don't mind. In my father's house, there are mansions there for you. Your own is there, my own is there, and as we launch, move together, and we get, re get ready, and we get there, every one of us will get our own mansion in Jesus' name. But he said, I, if I go and prepare a place for you, when I finish, eh, I will come again. That's a good news. Said, I will come again to do what? And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So I'm coming to receive you. I pray you'll be ready so that he will receive you when he comes. So this prophecy we are seeing in John chapter 14 that he says, I will come again, must be fulfilled. So number two, why is Christ coming? To separate the sheep from the goats. To remove the chaff from the wheat. To remove the counterfeit from, from the original. To remove the fake from the imitation. There are two sets of people. The sheep and the goat. The wheat and the chaff. The original and the counterfeit. is going to come and do a separation. And I pray when that time comes, you will not be found wanting. Matthew chapter 25. And we are reading from verse 31. We are saying the reasons why he's coming again. Matthew 25 from verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. When he came the first time, he didn't come in glory. He came in a manger. He was born in a manger. There was no space safe even in the inn. But this time, as he's coming the second time, he's not coming in a manger. He's not coming as a babe. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's coming in his glory. And all, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. Before him shall be gathered all nations. Literally, you may interpret these all nations as if it is all countries. Nigeria, Ethiopia, Uganda, Ghana, Sri Leone, Canada, the U.S., Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, Germany, U uh, Ukraine. All countries. Uh, 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 that, that is literally. But in the actual sense, it means all nations means People with the same culture, with the same tribe. People with the same culture, with the same tribe. Which means every tribe, every culture will be represented. Will be gathered together. Whether you are a Gala, whether you are a Chief, whether you are an Englishman, whether you are an Igbo, whether you are a Bibio, all tribes in the whole world, all nations, and he will he shall separate them one from another. A meticulous work. A work without mistake. A work that no, the good will not be taken for the bad. The bad cannot be taken for the good. He will say, separate them carefully, meticulously, one from another. As a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. You know, as shepherds, even as human beings, we know that there are distinguishing characteristics of a sheep and the distinguishing characteristics of a goat. Once you see a goat, it's known. And when you see a sheep, it's known. You cannot take a goat for a sheep. Neither will you take a sheep for a goat. And so, 
he will, there will be no mistake. There will be no error. There will be nothing of taking a sinner who is referred to as a goat and take him where the sheep is. It cannot be. If you are still living in sin, you are not born again, your name has not entered the book of life, don't ever have, have hope that you will just that day mistakenly be put among the sheep, among where the believer, the righteous are. No, it's not possible at all. He will separate them one from another just as the shepherd will divide the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand. The believer, the righteous, people that have been washed in the blood of Jesus, people that have been born again, whose names have been written in the book of life, those that have come to Calvary and have looked at him and said, Behold the Son of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. And they repented of their sin. And they gave their lives to Christ. And they confessed their sin. And they repented in dust and ashes. And they made a promise that they are not going back to the world and to the sin. And their sins will be washed with the fountain that is flowing from Calvary. From a man's vein, the blood that is flowing will come. And wash their sins away and wash their records away. They are the sheep that will be set on the right hand. But the ghosts that are stubborn, the ghosts that are unrepentant, the ghosts that refuse to change, the ghosts that had the message of the gospel and they say, No, I'm not going to leave that my boyfriend. No, I'm not going to leave that my girlfriend. No, I'm not going to repent. No, I must continue in iniquity. That smoking of India hem, I will continue to smoke it whether they like it or not. Whatever the doctor says, I don't care. All I know is that I'm enjoying myself and they want to die of drug addiction. The goats who will die. At, because of abortion, consistent, continuous abortion. They did it before they cried, but now is now abortion is now a normal thing in their life, and they are like ghosts. Uh, they refuse to. Be, they are just stubborn, refuse to be converted, and they continue in their sin. No matter what you tell them, no matter the message, they are stubborn like goats. And they said they will remain in their sin, they will die in sin. They said, after all, it's something that kills somebody. It's something that is something that must kill somebody. So if my own is alcoholism, let it be the ghost who refuse to have a change of life, a change of character. Said the ghost on the left. They will be on the left hand side. These are the ones that will be separated for destruction and, and for them not to enter into heaven. Why is Christ coming again to reward his faithful followers? I said number one, to fulfill prophecy. Two, to separate the goat from the sheep. Three, to, to reward his faithful followers. There are those who have been following him faithfully, not, not haphazardly, not compromising follower. Today they are up, tomorrow they are down. Today they, they say Jesus is the Lord, the next day they compromise, they, 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 they see the multitude going into sin, they join them in going to sin. Though the people that Jesus is going to reward are those who have been following him faithfully. In the day, they are faithful. In the night, they are faithful. What does that mean? In the day, when people are openly, when people are seeing them, when they are where they are known, and they are following Christ, they are Christians. In the night, when they are out of sight, when, people, when they go to where people don't know them, when they go to where they are strangers, maybe when they travel out of their base, and they still continue to follow him. They know that Jesus is my Lord, is my Savior. Whether people uh, that knew me is there, whether people that didn't know me is there, they remain faithful to the Lord. They are following Christ not because of the human beings they see. They are following Christ because of who he is, Savior that saved his life. So he's coming to reward them. Revelation chapter 22. In verse 12, 
and behold, I come quickly, and my reward that I will give to my faithful followers is with me. So, he had not rewarded the faithful followers. People that have been righteous, persecuted, they stood their ground. More, they were mocked, they stood their ground. There was, they were maltreated, their things were taken, and they were denied their rights. They stood their ground. They said, no, I stand for righteousness. I will remain righteous with the Lord. Don't, don't give up. A day is coming when Jesus will come to reward you for your steadfastness, for your, for your continuity. And that day is coming. I pray when he comes, he will find you remaining faithful in Jesus' name. Number four, why is he coming? To execute righteous judgment. He's coming to execute righteous judgment in the world. To execute the righteous judgments of God and fight the battle of Armageddon. Jude verses 14 and verse 15. You know that the epistle of Jude is just one chapter. So Jude, maybe chapter 1, verse 14, verse 15. And Enoch also, the seven from Adam, prophesied of this, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Did you see it that that thousand, there's an, a plural, an S there to show plurality, to show is the multitude, ten thousands, uncountable multitudes of his saints. What is he coming to do? To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them, is coming to execute judgment. All the people who are persecuting Christians, all the people who are making mockery of the name of Jesus, some is in the beer parlor when they are drinking and they are drunk, and they turn the tumbler and the cup, into the musical instruments and be singing the song of Zion in the land of uh, unrighteousness, in the place of iniquity. One day, today is your turn, tomorrow will be the turn of God. He will come to execute judgment. He will call you to question and you are going to answer for yourself. He's coming to pull down all rule of wickedness. Every policy promulgated and implemented on wickedness he's coming to he's coming to execute righteous judgment on it they may think that today they are free they may think yes we have finished our tenure and we have we have, we have we have gone away with all we did no a day of retribution is coming a day that God will call you to question is coming. A day of accountability is coming, and that day you will give account. He will execute righteous judgments, and he will fight the battle of Armageddon to pull down all rule of wickedness. Why is he coming? To restore Israel. Now, Israel seems to be forgotten. Now, this is the time of the plan of God for the church. And so, Israel is not now in the plan of God, but a time is coming that God, when he finishes with the church, he will return to his program with Israel. According to Romans chapter 11, that is when he says, and all Israel shall be what? Shall be saved. So, God is coming to restore Israel to her original place uh, in his plan. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. I read verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and I'm reading verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him 
as one money for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In chapter 11, verse 1. Let's go ahead in, uh, in verse 11. In that day shall there be a great morning in Jerusalem, as the morning of Hadarimon in the valley of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn, every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, and the family of Shimel apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For what purpose? For sin and for uncleanness. The sins then of the children of Israel a fountain will be opened. God will return to his original plan for Israel and this fountain that will be opened in, uh, for the house of David and in Jerusalem will cleanse every sin and every unrighteousness after they have mourned, after they have cried, after they have repented, after they have looked for their Savior they rejected, they will be looking for him whom they have what? Pierced. The Savior they pierced with the sword on the cross. The Savior they whipped and they used a crown of tongues on him and blood was gushing from the head, from the side, from the hands, from the palms of the hands and from the legs. And he was shedding his blood and they said, yes, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Their children will cry. That repentance they didn't do that day. This is when they will do that repentance. And God of mercy... God, who is rich in mercy, will have mercy upon them and restore them to the original position. I pray you, if you have gone away, if you have gone back from your commitment, if you have gone back into the world, if you have gone back to your vomit, if you have gone back into the old things you rejected, please, I want to plead with you, come back now. The, that this fountain is still flowing from a man's vein and he will still restore you and will still cleanse you just as the prodigal son was accepted by the father every prodigal son every prodigal daughter will be accepted as you come back to him in jesus name so he will going to restore israel and even now restore every backslider that will come unto him in genuine sincere repentance this is why, and many more reasons, why Christ will be coming back to fulfill prophecy, to separate the sheep from the goats, to reward the faithful followers, execute righteous judgment, fight the battle of Armageddon, restore Israel to the original position. And then the second question is, where? Where is he coming? He is coming to the edge. He is coming physically to the edge. But now, not as a child in a manger, but as a lion of the tribe of what? Judah. And I need to say that Christ's coming is in two phases. The phase one, he comes for the church. In phase two, he comes for the entire world. In phase one, he comes for the church to catch away, to rapture, to collect, to pick the saints, people whose names have been written in the book of life. He is coming in the first phase to pick them and then take them to where he is, as we read in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, is coming for the church, which is the bride of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm reading verse 57. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
we read in verse 57. Sorry, let's take it from verse 52. Verse 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. It's not coming to pick us with this mortal body we are carrying. It's coming to change our mortal body into an immortal body. It's coming to give us a glorified body. It's coming to give us a body that is not going to die. And so this flesh and blood we have will not inherit the kingdom of God, which shall be what? <clears throat> it shall be changed. How? In a moment in verse 52. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be what? Changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on what? Immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in what? In victory. So it's coming to catch away, to carry away the church by changing our mortal body into what? Into immortality. And we shall be changed and go with the glorified body. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I read from verse 15. In chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of God. It's not by our imagination. It's not by a, a, a mortal man thinking and, uh, and figuring it out. He said, by the word of God that endureth forever. By the word of God that does not fail. By the word of God that is unchangeable. By the word of God that must be fulfilled. This we say, by this word of God that is incorruptible, that we which are alive, alive in righteousness, and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent, proceed, obstruct them which are asleep that are dead in Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. All those who have died in Christ, they, they gave their lives to Christ, they were born again, their sins were forgiven, their names entered the book of life, and they lived a righteous life all through and followed him. He said they will rise first. Then those who are alive, alive physically, alive righteously, alive according to the word of God, we then follow them. And it will happen as we read it in 1 Corinthians within a twinkling of what? An eye. So, when he says within a twinkle on a fire, before you finish to repent, this rapture has taken place. Before you run and say, ah, that restitution, let me go and finish, conclude it, it will be late. Late preparation will not merit you, will not uh, grant you entrance into heaven. Postponing and keep postponing and keep postponing, I will do it today, I will do it tomorrow, and let me still enjoy small. Once the trumpet sound, the church will, will be raptured and you will not have opportunity to go and make right the things you have been nursing. That is why it says the Lord himself is not just sending an angel, an angel to do it for him. Himself is coming. You may deceive an angel but you cannot deceive Jesus. You may deceive the pastor, but you will not deceive Jesus. You may deceive the preachers, and you may deceive your neighbor. You may deceive your wife, and your wife will say, I know my husband. My husband is faithful. My husband is right. My husband is sincere. But you can't deceive Christ. That day, we will know 
Nobody will deceive him. So he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, that's what we saw in verse 15, we, which are alive and remain, see the Holy Ghost repeating the condition to be part of the rapture. See the Holy Ghost repeating it again and again on the, the same passage, verse 15, exactly that way in verse 17. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be what? Be with the Lord. I pray you will be with the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see that is the first phase of Christ's coming. But I need to tell you that at this first phase of the rapture, when he appears in the air, not everybody will see him. The unbelievers will still be going about with their normal duty. They are driving. They are going to work. They are fetching water. They are going to market. They are marrying and they are cooking and they are um, partying. They will continue with what they were doing. They will not know when the saints will go. So they will not have opportunity of even making amends for their life. But when he comes in the second phase, He's coming to the entire world. And I need to explain the first phase, the, the time between the first phase and the second phase is a period of seven years. After the rapture, things will continue normal for a period of what? Seven years. It's after that seven years that he will come physically that all eyes will do what? We see him and he's coming to the entire earth. Look at Matthew in chapter 25. Sorry, let's first see Matthew chapter 14. In verse uh, Matthew chapter 14, I read verses 30 to 31. <clears throat> and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all tribes of the earth, do we see it there? All tribes of the earth, the Englishman, the German, the Frenchman, the Igbo man, every tribe that you, can, that you know that existed on this earth, all tribes of the earth, will they be laughing? Will they be saying, yes, welcome, welcome? No. The Bible says they shall do what? They will mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They will see him in power. They will see him in his glory. And they will mourn. They will be mourning because they have abused him. They'll be mourning because they rejected him. They'll be mourning because the salvation that he brought, they abandoned it and they, they didn't take it. And now the reality of their life of sin will be open to them. You don't need anybody to teach them at that time. You don't need anybody to warn them at, the, at that time. You don't, any, you don't need anybody to be telling them, you see, what I've been telling you, that no, it will be clear. To every one of them. And verse 31. And he shall send his angels. With a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together. His elect. From the four winds. From one end of heaven. To the other. I need to explain. When he talks of his elect. He's talking about the Jews. He's talking about the children of Israel. The elect is not the church. The church is the bride of Christ. The elect is the children of Israel. And so when he appears in the sky, uh, one, all eyes will see him. All tribes of the earth will see him and mourn. They will see his great glory. They will see him with his power. And they will be regretting. Oh, what have I done to myself? 
So this thing they are saying is true. I didn't know it's, as, it's going to be like this. Uh, all those in the opposite religion, all those in the orthodox religion, all those in the evangelicals and, the, and even those in the Pentecostals, all those who go to church by name, but not by character and conduct. They go to church, they are still thieves. They go to church, they are still committing adultery. They go to church, they are still living in sin. They will see him. They will mourn and say, so this is true. I thought my pastor was, uh, was joking. I thought he was trying to make me afraid. So this thing he's saying is true. So it has come to reality. I pray you will not be there to cry that cry of regret. So he's coming to the entire world in Matthew chapter 25. I'm reading from verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Before him shall be gathered all nations. Nobody will be left behind. No tribe will be forgotten. No tribe will say, oh, we didn't. all of them must appear one by one. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. In, uh, that's in verse 32. So we see he's coming in his second phase to separate. And I said before that between the first coming in the rapture and the second coming for all the world and all the earth, is a period of what? Seven good years. And that time of that seven years will be the time of the great tribulation, which we'll be studying much later in detail as God gives us opportunity. But just note now that he's coming. He's coming for the church, for the bride. He's coming for the entire world. The next, the third question is, when is he coming? I told us the rapture, the first phase is coming in the rapture. But I need to tell you, rapture has no sign. There is no sign, you say, when I see this one happen, I know that the rapture is near. No, rapture has no signs, no timing. It can be any moment. That's what we read in um, First Corinthians, say, within a twinkling of an eye. Before you blink your eyes, before you close it and open it, the rapture has taken place. Sudden, without warning. That's why Jesus said, I come as a thief, unannounced. I, I won't write letter. I won't tell you, what, what then do you do? You prepare yourself. That is to tell you for the rapture in Revelation chapter 16. Let, we read it before, but let's still read it again. In Revelation, Revelation chapter 16, I read verse 15. If you are with your Bible, turn your Bibles with me. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I as a thief, I come without warning. I come without a sign. I come without any period announcement. I'm coming unannounced as a thief. So the rapture will come suddenly without information, without you getting ready. That means you must be ready beforehand. If you are not ready beforehand, you'll be taken unawares. Revelation chapter 3, I read from verse 1. And unto the angel of the church inside this right, this thing said he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy words that thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful. Be watchful. Watch. Because there is no sign. You are not going to hear any other sign apart from the, this preaching and the messages you are hearing all over the place. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy words perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and had and hold fast and repent. 
If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief if you refuse to watch, if you refuse to repent, if you refuse to amend your life, if you refuse to make ready and you know to make correction and take correction and put your life in order and be and be and, and be watching. He said, I will come as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Say you will not know. Nobody knows when the rapture will take place. Anybody that tells you that is a false preacher. And because we are reading it in the Bible, and it says, And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So, to be on the safe side, watch. Prepare your life, amend your way, get ready as a wife waiting for the return of his groom. Mark chapter 13. Gospel according to St. Mark. I read chapter 13, verse 33 through to 37. It says, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. Take heed, watch, watch over your life, watch over the people you go with, watch over your actions, watch over your words, watch over what you are doing. Why? For you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch you therefore. As a result of the fact that you don't know when he's coming, watch. As a result of the time that he is coming at the time you may not know, watch. For you know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. Let's come in suddenly. His coming for the rapture will be very sudden. Unprepared. Will you sing? Will, you, will that be your cry? Unprepared to meet the Savior. Unprepared to be taken uh, away with the church. Let's come in suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. I'm saying unto all in all continents of the world. In Africa, in Asia, in, in American continent, in South America, in Canada, in Europe, in, in all continents of the world. I'm saying to you all, watch. Whether you are Britain, watch. Whether you are from America, watch. Whether you are in the village, watch. Whether you are a poor man as a farmer, watch. Whether you are top in the civil service, watch. Whether you are top in the business uh, uh, class, watch. Whatever status, whatever uh, uh, this thing you belong to, in the academia, watch. Everybody must watch. Watch over your life. Watch over the way you are dealing with others. So that that day will not take you unawares. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. And I'm reading from verse 42. In Matthew 24, from verse 42 through to verse 44. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken up. Therefore be you also ready. Be you ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. We are to, when for the church, for the rapture, there's no time. You cannot estimate it. That is why you 
Keep postponing your repentance. Keep postponing your restitution. Keep postponing your making your life right. You are playing to the gallery is a dangerous game. And you will lose. I'm telling you honestly, you are the one that is going to lose if you don't make ready now and come to the Lord. But for the rest of the world, he will come seven years after the rapture. He will end the great tribulation because the great tribulation period is a period of seven years of unparalleled hardship and torment on humanity by the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be unleashing his hatred and anger and God will also be pouring his wrath on the unrepentant. It's going to be a terrible moment. I do not pray that you will be, you will be here on earth during that period. If it is difficult for you now to repent and to follow the Lord, is it at that time you think it will be easy for you? No. That is why do not gamble with your life. Make sure all the necessary restitution, repent, amend your life, correct it, so that when the Lord comes, you will not be taken by surprise. So, uh, so that you will not be part of those that will be in the great tribulation and the reign of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. As we round off, I need to ask you some questions. How do you want Christ to meet you? We say, behold, he's coming. Yes, certainly. For his coming is certain. But the question is, how will you want him to meet you? Will you meet, do you want him to meet you still living in adultery? Do you want him to meet you still living in sin? Do you want him to meet you still a, a drunkard? Do you want him to meet you still in drug and stealing and an arm robber? Do you want him to meet you as a second or third wife in another man's house and you are taking, driving away the legitimate wife and you are taking her position and say, yes, my darling, what type of darling is that? How do you want Christ to meet you? Do you want him to meet you in the rapture or at the great tribulation period? The next question I need to ask you is what necessary preparation are you going to do in order to be part of the rapture? You need to answer these questions yourself. I will not answer it for you because I don't know your mind. You that know yourself, you should be able to answer it for yourself. When, how do you want the Lord to meet you? Two, are you making the necessary preparations so that you will be part of those that will hear the sound of the trumpet and you go with him in the rapture. This is the time, we, the point we need to pray now. We need to bow down our heads. We need to call upon the Lord. You need to pray. He is coming. Definite. Sure. No argument. The scripture have told us by the word of God is coming. But how will he meet you? When you are ready, with the garment of righteousness, or he will meet you in sin, he will meet you unrepentant, he will meet you crying and mourning with all the trials of the earth, he will even meet you as a goat that be separated, as a chaff that be thrown into the fire that will be burning unquenchable. How do you want the Lord to meet you? That is where we need to pray. I want you to call upon the Lord and tell him from the bottom of your heart, in sincerity, you can come. There is still space. That the blood flowing from a man's vein is there. If you will come to Calvary, he will, flow, he will cleanse you. He will wash you. He will cleanse you. If you will repent of your sin, if you will get ready so that he will not take, meet you on our ways, your name will enter the book of life. As we pray now, I want you to talk to the Lord and ask the Lord, do not meet me when I'm not ready. Help me to be ready so that that day will not take me on our ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we commit to all the people who are looking up to you and who are taking decisions and they have come to Calvary and they are asking you for 
for help. They are asking you for cleansing. They are asking you, Lord, wipe away every record of their past. Give them the grave for a new life. I ask, do it for them in Jesus' name. I pray you will not meet them unprepared. Help them to be ready so that they will be among the sheep that will go with the Lord when you are separating the sheep from the goat, the child from the wheat, that they will not be thrown into the fire unquenchable in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you've answered. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. If you have taken this decision, I need to encourage you. You can reach us from the phone numbers and the information you see there. And we can extend help. We can extend fellowship with you and to see how to groom you so that your garment will not be soiled until you see the Lord face to face. Thank you and God bless you.